Okay, so I think I'll just start because we all want to go to Don't Stalk later, right? So today is probably the class where the hardest stuff goes on, and even for me. So I will concentrate on the main ideas of this hard stuff, which is the rich flow. But before, let's continue our understanding of three manifolds. So by now, our understanding goes more or less like this. We have a closed three manifold, then we decompose it by spheres, we get prime factors, then prime factors are either irreducible or S2 process one. Then we go to the JSJ components, but we figure that they aren't the best ones. So we need to remove these twisted bundles over the Klein bottles, and we create this geometric decomposition. And in the geometric decomposition, the pieces that appear are either cipher fiber, atoroidal, or torus bundles. And then we know that, uh, no, we don't know yet. So, and let's state precisely the geometrization conjecture in this setting, because so far the conjecture was like this. The interior of every compact tree manifold admits a canonical decomposition, which pieces have a geometric structure. Now, now that we have the geometric decomposition, we can actually present it a little differently, more uh, precise, more, more co correctly with the environment we are. If M is a closed, orientable, irreducible tree manifold, then the geometric decomposition of M separates it into pieces which are all geometric and are modeled in geometries that admit compact quotients. So this would be the correct geometrization conjecture from today's point of view. And the properties that we have so far are given by Thurston's theorems. And the first one, there are- uh, no sir, I have a doubt. Sure. Uh, sir, I'm not able to understand the meaning of compact quotients. Can you repeat that, please? Uh, so can you please explain the meaning of compact quotients? I'm not able to understand it. Of compact quotients. Oh, yeah, sure. I, 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 will, I will show that right now. Uh, what, what does it mean to have a compact quotient? It's like your whole ambient space admits a subgroup of the group of isometries that acts in this space and that the quotient by this action is compact. So you have a free action from a subgroup of the isometry group where this quotient is now compact. Like R3, R3, you can have three uh, translations like 0, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And then the quotient of R3 by this group generated by these three isometries is gonna be the three torus. So it's compact, it's closed many. Uh, is that more clear? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So there are only eight geometries of dimension three that actually admit a compact quotient. Uh, they are R3, S3, H3, S2 cross R, H2 cross R, NIL3, SL2 or tilde, and SOL3. And we presented their definitions yesterday. And the second theorem that Thurston proved is that if you are geometric, the model geometry is unique. You cannot be geometric and with two distinct geometries. Again, the geometric structure could be different, but not the geometry. And finally, uh, there is some sort of classification of geometries. If you are geometric, you can say which geometry you have based on the topology of your manifold. So, let me give just a basic scheme of the proof that there are only these eight geometries. Uh, the, the whole proof is a little more complicated, uh, not more complicated, it's more, uh, you need to go through the steps with more care because for instance, here it's not gonna be clear where I use that they admit a compact quotient. So this is just like to organize the ideas of why you have actually just eight geometries and which they are. So let X, G be a model geometry and assume that it admits a compact quotient. Now you fix your point, any point that you want because a model geometry is a homogeneous manifold in the end. So any point is gonna be the same. 
and you take this isotropy group, the group of isometries that leave this point fixed. So you take the identity component of this isotropy group, and this is a connected group that acts on the tangent space of your manifold, Txm, Txx. So it acts in this tangent space as a group of rotations because it's going to be by isometries. In particular, it has to be a connected subgroup of the orthogonal group of O3. Since it is a connected subgroup of O3, we understand O3 uh, easily. There are only three cases. Either G is isomorphic to SO3, the whole group, the whole connected component, or it is isomorphic to SO2, which would be the rotations around one direction, or it's trivial. It's just the identity. That's the connected component, remember that. So if it's the whole group, then X is going to be one of those anisotropic manifolds. Any point is the same, but also any direction is the same. In particular, it has constant curvature, and it's either H3, R3, or S3. Now, if you have a one parameter action, a one group of rotations, what happens, what you can prove is that this group of rotations will have a kernel, will have a line in Txx, and this line is going to stay put. It doesn't change it. This line actually now can be translated all over the group, and this creates a line field, like a line vibration by R. And then you can see that uh, you have this orthogonal distribution, the plane field, also plane field. And if this plane field is integrable, you can prove using that it admits compact quotients that it splits as a product. So your whole uh, geometry is either H2 cross R, R2 cross R, or S2 cross R. But R2 cross R cannot happen in this setting because then the full group of isometries would have to be, uh, of isotropies would have to be SO3. So it's actually H2 cross R or uh, S2 cross R. Finally, if this plane field is not integrable, then you have a non-trivial submersion over something of constant curvature. And then we know that you are either the Berger spheres, new tree, or SL2 R tilde. But yesterday I said that the Berger spheres, they don't have maximal isometry group. You can extend the group of isometries of the Berger spheres to the group of isometries of S3. So it's not Berger spheres, and you have either new or SL. Finally, if the group is trivial, then what's happening? You don't have any rotations. You don't have any rotations. You might have reflections like a discrete finite subgroup, but the connected component is just the identity. So this group is acting on your manifold transitively and is actually one to one. For each point, you have only one isometry. For each point, you have only one isometry. So your whole manifold, your whole X, will have a structure of a Lie group. You can endow the structure of your isometry group to your whole manifold, to your X. And it's going to be G. Your manifold will be G. Then we can show that this group is, it cannot be non-unimodular. It's going to be unimodular. That's just the definition. Don't go there. And then Milner shows that which are the unimodular group of dimension three simply connected. And we know that they are uh, S3, R3, SL2, R tilde, the, the Euclidean group, a new tree or sol tree. And then you just look at which ones they can be. Uh, S3, R3, and SL2, R tilde, no, you can do because they have higher uh, order, higher dimensional group. Uh, the Euclidean group is not a geometry. New tree also has a higher dimensional isometry group, so you're left with sol three. So that's the scheme of the proof. Uh, not every step here is more complicated than by the sounds. Okay, idea of the proof of theorem two that you cannot have two distinct 
isometries for your uh, two distinct geometries for your manifold. So assume that you have a, a geometric manifold modeled by two distinct geometries, a by contradiction. And we have some easy cases to rule out. The first one, if the first geometry is S3, then we know that M has finite phi one, has finite fundamental group. Then any other geometry uh, creates things with infinite fundamental groups, so Y is also S3. Same goes for S2 plus R. There are only two manifolds closed orientable modeled by S2 plus R. So we know that they are they cannot be modeled by anything else. So Y is also S2 plus R. Now, if H, if H is X, if X is not H3, then we know that pi one of M contains a Z cross Z subgroup. H3 is the only isometry that creates this atoroidal manifolds. So Y cannot be H3 either. And the last easy case is if X is sultry, then we know that M is a torus bundle. And so Y is also sultry. Those are the easy cases to, 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 to look. Now, the other cases that remain are when both X and Y are in this one, two, three, four other geometries. And we may assume that they are distinct. What happens? All these isometries, oh, all these isometries, all these geometries, they give rise to cipher fiber spaces. So M will have two non-isomorphic cipher vibrations. By the classification of cipher fiber spaces, I didn't go into this detail, but it's true. We know that the only possibilities is that M are, is covered by S3, by S2 cross S1, or by S1 cross S1 cross S1. S3 is not in this list. S2 cross S1 would be S2 cross R is not in this list. So it remains S1 cross S1 cross S1, which is modeled by R3. S1 cross S1 cross S1 is the three tars. So it is a quotient of R3. So we know that uh, this both isometries are R3. Isometries, why do I keep saying isometries? These two geometries, these two geometries. I'm talking about geometrization, not isometrization, it's geometrization. Okay, so both geometries are going to be R3 and that's a contradiction. So you have a unique geometry for, for your manifold. Theorem three, I'm gonna, I'm not going to present an, any, any idea of the proof because it is a hard case analysis. You go over the isometry group of each of the eight geometries, and, but, but I can present a refined version of it, which is better for classification. And theorem three basically says, a closed M -M uh, manifold admits a geometric structure modeled in one of these geometries, R3, S3, S2 cross R, H2 cross R, SL tilde, or NIL, which are the cipher fiber geometries, if and only if M is cipher fiber, and we can make this table characterizing the model geometry by the Euler number of the vibration. Remember that sum of those, uh, of those rational numbers and by the Euler characteristic of the base space of the orbifold as a surface. So we have this table. If the Euler number is zero, then you have a horizontal surface and the model geometries are gonna be H2 cross R if the base orbifold has negative Euler characteristic, R3 if the base orbifold uh, has zero Euler characteristic or S2 cross R if the base orbifold has positive Euler characteristic. And if you don't have any horizontal surface, the same thing goes. You have either S2 L tilde, the Heisenberg group or the three sphere. So this is very useful, very, very useful, this theorem to classify uh, geometries. It's, it's like you look at the orbifold, you look at the sacred vibration, you look at everything, calculate things, and you know what is the model geometry. Okay. 
So again, here's the geometrization conjecture, and let's start to prove it. First, let's start to prove it by Thurston's way of uh, train of thought. Okay, so first, from the JSJ decomposition, you have either cipher fiber uh, pieces or atoroidal pieces. Then we replace this uh, twisted bundle over the Klein bottle by, you, we change the, the boundary torus by the central Klein bottle and we create the geometry decomposition. And now we added torus bundles by the classification of the cipher fiber spaces. We may prove, I didn't, but we may, we may prove that the cipher fiber spaces with infinite fundamental group, if we know that pi one of these cipher fiber spaces are infinite, then they are geometric. And it, you can also show that it's an only if also, the geometric pieces that are porous bundles that appear in the geometric decomposition, the they will have to be solved manifolds. So basically, we need to prove elliptization conjecture, which is if pi one is finite, if you are finite by one, you are cipher fiber actually, then you are geometric and the model geometry is S3. And this is like Poincaré has conjecture boosted up version two, and actually they are 100% equivalent, but, and also hyperbolization conjecture, because here we don't say anything about S3 or H3. The other geometries are classified on this theory. So now we need elliptization to obtain S3 in one case, and we need hyperbolization to obtain H3 in the last case, which is a toroidal. Okay, basically, let me show everything in a picture again because I think it's easier to follow. We are in this slide right now, and we know that the geometric pieces of the composition are either cipher fiber, well, are either cipher fiber, a toroidal, or torus bundles. We know that the torus bundles have sol geometry and they are geometric. We know that cipher fiber spaces have either finite or infinite fundamental group. And if they have infinite fundamental group, they are ge uh, geometric. And we have these five geometries to choose. And that table would classify the, the, the geometries. So we need to solve these two problems here. When finite pi one, what happens? We want to show that it's only S3. And when you have an atoroidal piece, what happens? We want to show that it's only H3. So this would be hyper hyperbolization conjecture to prove this last part. And this would be elliptization conjecture to prove this last part. And this actually is true. This actually is true. And this is what we have as our geometrization. This is the complete description of the geometric components that we have. And basically, this picture is the answer somehow, in some sense, to that super hard question. What are all closed orientable free manifolds? It's not an easy description. Yeah, but let's talk about Thurston's work a little more because Thurston didn't just conjecture this. Uh, even conjecturing this and proving it at this point so far would be an amazing result. Like even without proving elliptization and hyperbolization, Thurston results got so far here and only these two pieces were missing, but Thurston, he gave more, he gave us more. So let's talk about Thurston's main result. So far, we are not still in Thurston's main result. It's, 
all, all that picture is person, but it's not his main result. Before presenting his main result, I need an, just a last definition. What is a Hacken tree manifold? A Hacken tree manifold is a manifold that is irreducible. So you cannot cut it into every sphere bounds a ball. And it contains at least one orientable incompressible surface. Why is this definition important? Because then you can cut your manifold. If your manifold is hacking, it contains one surface which is incompressible. You don't know the topology, you don't have to. But this surface can be used to simplify your manifold. You can cut your manifold using this surface. And then Thurston could start some process that cuts and cuts and cuts and cuts, and then he could conclude geometrization using this one, this first irreducible part, this first irreducible surface. So in particular, if you know what that means, any boundary irreducible manifold is hacking. Okay, so the main theorem of Thurston is this, hyperbolization holds for Hacken manifolds. We know that if you have a Hacken manifold which has no Z cross Z subgroup, then it is geometric and it is, uh, the geometry is hyperbolic. Basically, geometrization holds for these manifolds. So why? Because you still need hyperbole, you still need elliptization to prove geometrization. But the thing is, any Hacken manifold will always have infinite fundamental group because you have a surface and this surface is incompressible. So any surface group is either trivial if you are a sphere and spheres are never incompressible in irreducible manifolds, you can always bound bound a ball. So you have higher genus. So you have at least something infinite inside your fundamental group. So you don't fall into uh, elliptic manifolds. You don't need them for Hacken manifolds and geometrization holds for Hacken manifolds. And here is the precise statement of Thurston main result is if you have a compact orientable Hacken tree manifold with either empty or toroidal boundary, and it's not diffeomorphic to these three exceptional spaces, and I talked about them already, then geometrization, the geometric decomposition of M yields only geometric components. This is Thurston's actual main result. Okay. In Warsaw, 1982, something happened for revolutionizing the study of topology in two and three dimensions showing interplay between analysis, topology, and geometry, and contributing to the idea that a very large class of closed tree manifolds carry a hyperbolic structure, Thurston was awarded with the Fields Medal. Like, he deserved it. He deserved it. And I love this picture. I love this picture. Here, Thurston is like playing with this huge knot. After Thurston got the Fields Medal, he kind of devoted himself to showing that mathematics is fun. He, 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 he spent a long time showing to people that mathematics is not about paying your texts. It's not hard. A good mathematics is not hard. Good mathematics is beautiful. And he was trying to introduce these concepts. There are some videos of Thurston like playing with knots, and I love those videos. They are so cool. You, you know that the guy loved what he was doing. And here's a quote by John Morgan. Uh, four years ago, he gave, well, John Morgan was one of the guys that really understood first Perelman's papers. I will talk about them next. And this quote, I think it's beautiful to describe the importance of Thurston's work. Before Thurston's work, he didn't say this, but is in the context, there was no strong reason to believe that Poincaré's conjecture was either true or false. He even says something like, 
it was 50 50. Some people were trying to prove it, some people were trying to find counterexamples. But then the fact that you put the Poincare conjecture, which was about one particular tree manifold, in a vast conjecture that is supposed to classify all tree manifolds, and you have some positive evidence for it, makes you believe that you shouldn't spend your time looking for a counterexample. I love this quote. Like before Thurston's work, yeah, could be true, could be false, but then Thurston puts everything into perspective. And eventually everybody, yeah, let's put our heads together to prove when has conjecture. And they did, <laughs> they did. So in the rest of the talk, I will try to explain the proof of geometrization, but from a uh, historic point of view, from a intuitive point of view, just so we understand what is going on, but the details, they will be hard analysis. They are hard analysis. And I'm not even able to present the whole details of these groups, okay? So I'll give you the intuitive version. Warm up, curve shortening flow. Start with any simple closed curve in R2. Any simple closed curve, no intersections, and it's gamma zero. And we assume that it's parametrized by arc length, that's PBAL. And you look at the curvature vector of this curve. So there are points where the curvature vector points inside, there are points where the curvature vector points outside, there are points where the curvature is high. So the modulus of this vector is going to be the absolute curvature. And there are points where it's almost flat. Curvature is almost zero. So we have this curvature vector for your curve. Now you want to look at this equation. The derivative of the curve of a family of curves. Remember, you were thinking as this, of this curve as gamma zero. So you will look for deformations of this curve. It's gonna have a parameter gamma t. So s will be the arc length of the curves and t will be which curve you are in. And you look at this equation, the, the derivative with respect to t of gamma t of s is equal to the curvature vector of the curve gamma t at that point. So, and with initial conditions, your initial gamma. Yeah, it should be gamma zero of s equals gamma zero of s, I'm sorry. And you see what happens. This is a parabolic PDE for the ones that know analysis. And it admits a solution, at least for a short time, but actually it's the whole time. And what happens with this solution? The solution can be seen as a deformation of your original curve on the normal vector on the, the direction of the curvature. And something like this happens. Here, what's going on? When the curvature points to the inside of the curve, the curve moves inside. When the curvature points outside, the curvature moves, the, the curve moves outside. So it will start to do this kind of aspect. It will start to move on the points where the curvature goes to the inside, the curve will go to the inside. On the points of the curvature is pointing to the outside, it will go to the outside. And eventually what happens is that the curve becomes convex. This is proved by, I, I, I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot the, the correct reference, but this was proved like in the 80s, 70s, 80s. Eventually the curve will become convex. So what a convex curve means, it means that the curvature vector points all the way to the inside. Now you don't have any more uh, moving to the outside. Before you had parts moving to the inside, parts moving to the outside. Now you don't, now everything is gonna move to the inside. So if you continue the flow, convexity is preserved. You move to the inside and you remain convex. And eventually you start to getting rounder and rounder and rounder and closer to a circle 
until you, in finite time, you collapse. In finite time, your curve will start shrinking down to a point. And this point will be closer and closer to being round in the sense that if, if you rescale, if you rescale like to, to, for instance, to assume constant area, every simple closed curve in R2 separates, so it has a compact region. So you can rescale to have area one. Then you will see that asymptotically, these curves, these rescaled curves would converge to circles. And this flow has a lot of good properties. Uh, so, so this would be like the, the whole picture of the flow. You start with this non-convex curve. Of course, this is symmetric, so it's a little easier to, to see, but it didn't have to have any symmetry. And eventually it will, be, it will evolve, becomes convex, and then shrink. And it distributes curvature all around. One thing that you can actually see is called uh, the maximum principle. If two curves don't intersect at, at any time, they will never intersect when you run this flow. So for instance, if you take a large circle, we know the flow in this large circle. The flow in this large circle is just shrinking down to a point in some time. Maybe one of the radius is the time or something or maybe the radius, I'm not sure. Yeah, so this circle is shrinking down to a point. And we know that this circle at time t will never intersect the solution at time t of the first curve. So eventually the curve will actually shrink down to a point. Okay, so this was the, oh yeah, just a remark. This is the one dimensional analog of something called the mean curvature flow. Mean curvature is some extrinsic object. It depends on how the curve is inside of how the hypersurface or surface lies inside your ambient space, just like this. We are using R2. We are using the curvature vector that the embedding of the curve in R2 gives. Curves don't have intrinsic curvature. Remember that curves, uh, they are all the same. They are uh, poisonetric. So we need uh, an ambient space to curves have curvature. Okay, something similar. Maybe I should have gone through this first. The heat flow. If you have a metal bar or any material, any bar or any surface, any object, and you have a distribution of temperature of heat, then you don't have any other source of heat. It will eventually uh, bring heat from the hot spot to the cold spots and even out. So this is the heat flow and the heat flow even, if, if, uh, heat flow, the heat flow evens out the distribution of temperature. So, and converges to a solution of constant temperature. This is more or less what the curve shortening flow does, but the curve shortening flow does that with curvature. It will eventually distribute the curvature, of course, in, in the shortening flow, you are collapsing, but eventually if you are rescaling, it's like a curvature flow. And if you are talking about heat flows and flows and curvature flows, you need to mention Richard Hamilton. And this is a quote by him not too long ago. And it's, it's like this. If you just kind of think, I, I love that it's kind of think. If you just kind of think, what a float should look like, you want it to be second order and parabolic and quasi-linear, and you like it to diffuse equally in all the directions. And it turns out that there is only one flow that has that property, which is the Ricci flow. And I want on the next slides to explain why. Why is he interested in the Ricci flow? Why am I suddenly talking about analysis? because I was talking about topology, geometry, and how it's all analysis, apparently. Yeah, it's gonna be analysis for a while. First, I need to define, uh, if you don't know what that is, what the Ricci curvature is. So you take your Riemannian manifold. In our Riemannian manifold, 
you have a differentiable manifold and a metric. And you take vector fields X, Y, and Z, and you have the curvature tensor equals to this uh, expression here. And you have the Ricci tensor, which is basically the trace of the curvature tensor when you uh, make it with uh, another inner product. You use the metric as well. So this is the Ricci tensor, which is basically the Ricci curvature. And you can use an orthogonal basis to compute this trace, but I don't like choosing an orthogonal basis because we will change the metric soon. But so, but this is well defined. The trace is always well defined. And just a remark, and this remark is essential for we understanding the Ricci flow. M is a differentiable manifold. It still doesn't have a metric. And the, 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 the algebra of vector fields is well defined without a metric. So X, Y, and Z, they all exist without a metric. What the metric does is to change lengths, is to change angles, but these vectors, they exist before you have a metric. If, the vectors if these vectors exist before you have a metric, we can think as the Ricci tensor applied in these vectors as a function of the metric. For each metric we choose, this will have a number. For each metric you pick, this will be well-defined and this will give you a number. Actually, this will give you a function on the manifold because this can depend on the point you're choosing, but yeah, it's a number, a real number. So this is really important for you to understand the rich flow equation. Now we have the definition of the Ricci tensor, and we have a smooth family of Riemannian metrics. Think of a family of Riemannian metrics on your manifold. Fix two vector fields and fix a point. So for each t, this is a number. Ricci of x, y on the metric g of t applied in a point. Also, this is a tensor. A symmetric tensor. It's a little work to prove that this is a symmetric tensor, but it follows from the symmetry from the symmetry of the Riemann tensor. So don't worry about it. This is a symmetric tensor. And what's more important is that we have the metric. The matrix always works like that. Also, is symmetric. The metric is symmetric for each t. Given x, y, and p, we have a number. For each t, we have a number. This is a real function. Like this thing here is a real function. For each t, we have a number. So this is a real function. We can take derivatives of real functions. And one thing that we see is that this derivative with respect to t of this real function is also a symmetric tensor. So at least this. Equation makes sense. At least they are on the same space and we can understand it uh, with for given X, Y's and B's in your manifold. And this equation is the rigid flow, is the equation of the rigid flow. The solution uh, is what we will think of the flow of your manifold. Okay. So the fundamental remark is that this is a parabolic PDE, but this is not the fundamental part of the remark. The fundamental part of the remark is that it takes place on the space of Riemannian metrics for your manifold. The uh, variable here, not the variable incognita, how to say that? The hidden factor, what we want to find, we want to solve it for the metric. This equation, we want to solve this equation for the metric. We want to solve it for G. And this G will lie in the space of remaining metrics. 
So this is the fundamental remark. In particular, it doesn't change topology. Oh, topology. Yeah, we were in a course about geometric topology. There's something about topology that we need to keep in our heads. It just changes the metric of your manifold. It doesn't change your manifold. But yeah, okay, let's, let's keep on going. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, kind of. Eventually we can change topology. So let me give you examples of the rich flow, of solutions for the rich flow. Let's start with, yeah. Uh, so why, why was there a factor of two in the equation? Because it works. Because it works. I, everything that I, that I can know about this minus two, actually the, the, it's a minus two. And I just can tell you that it works like that. So I'm happy that the minus two is there. Probably there is to do with being parabolic, but I can actually, uh, what you mean is not parabolic. You could be weakly parabolic or strongly parabolic or something. As I said, I'm not an expert in analysis, but probably there's something to do with being parabolic. And I, what I can say is that because it works, but yeah. Okay, so let me give you a trivial example. You start with M as your topological three sphere, S3, and you start with the round metric, the metric of constant sectional curvature, the constant uh, curvature one. Now with something that the Ricci flow has a great property, it preserves isometries. Just think about it. If you have an isometry, you have a symmetry on the metric. If you have a symmetry on the metric, the Ricci curvature in this point will be equal to the Ricci curvature in this point. So when you evolve the flow, this isometry will remain an isometry. In particular, if you have a sphere which has all the possible isometries, when you run the flow, you will remain a round sphere. It will remain having all the possible isometries. In particular, the solution will be just a rescaling of the original metric. We don't know the parameter yet, but there is some function here, R of T, such that the solution for the Ricci flow will be R of T times G zero. Okay, four round spheres is just a simple computation to see that the Ricci tensor is just a multiple of the metric. And the multiple is going, is going to be this one, two times two divided by the radius squared. So Ricci tensor of the metric GT is this tensor here. But we know that GT is just a multiple of G0. So we can simplify. And the Ricci tensor is two divided by R times the original metric. Now, everything is an ODE and not a hard one, <laughs> like the simple, simple, simple ODE. The Ricci equation becomes R prime of T equals minus four divided by R. And we can solve it easily. R of T equals one, uh, the square root of one minus 14. Okay, but let's see a picture. You start with the round sphere and then the radius when T starts to increase, starts to decrease, and when you have time one fourth, you collapse. You develop a singularity. This is called the round point singularity. You are shrinking down to a point exactly like the curve shortening flow. So when I said before that you don't change the topology, I added that kinda, because when you reach a singularity, it collapses, everything is bad. So you might have to do something with your topology. Let me give you a second trivial example, which is a product. Start with S2 cross S1. So like, uh, basically like a torus and assume that this metric in S2 is the round metric and the metric in S1 is just DT, it's just the, the metric in S1. What happens with the Ricci flow 
is that it also preserves product metrics. If you have a product metric in your original manifold, you will see that the, 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 the equation will split into a system of equations and if the solutions will also split. They will also be uh, product metrics. So the rich flow preserves product metrics. It preserves isometries on the factors of this product metrics. So S1 has no intrinsic curvature. Curves don't have intrinsic curvature. So the factor S1 is going to be always S1. And the solutions will be just a rescaling of your original metric, of the round metric of S2, and they will remain this factor intact. And again, just like what happens to the round point collapsing here, the radius of this S2 is going to shrink, shrink, shrink to a point. But it's the radius of this S2 factor. So you still will have your S1. So here we are seeing a collapse to a lower dimensional manifold. You are seeing a collapse of the metric. The, the, the limit metric in finite time again will be basically zero on the S2 factor. I'm not counting this S2 factor anymore. And I just see the metric on S1. So this is another singularity, another type of singularity that the Ricci flow may develop. It's not just going all the way, everything going collapsed. You could also have a dimension reduction. You could have something of dimension three collapsing into something in this example of dimension one. Okay, let me give you a few properties of the Ricci flow. I already said that the rich flow changes the metric on your manifold, but the manifold is fixed. The topology is fixed. As long as the metric is smooth, the topology, you don't have to worry about it. It preserves asymmetries, it preserves product structures and several other nice properties of this flow. And it behaves like the curve shortening flow. It behaves more or less like the heat flow. It tries to distribute Ricci curvature in all directions. That was the first slide of Hamilton. Uh, that's why he is looking at the Ricci flow because it behaves like the curve shot and flow and that's good. Uh, you, it will become more clear like why in a few seconds. So solutions exist for a short time. Hamilton proved that for, for any initial data, you can have short time solutions. Uh, and you have uniqueness of solutions, Hamilton proved that, but singularities can happen at finite time. Uh, we've seen two examples of that. So let me try to explain the power of the Ricci flow with this theorem of Hamilton. This is probably the first main theorem using Ricci flow as uh, uh, something to obtain as a tool to obtain topological conditions from geometric ones. So if M is a closed free manifold that admits a metric of positive Ricci curvature, so if Ricci XX is everywhere positive, then it admits a metric of constant positive sectional curvature. Ricci is much weaker than sectional because Ricci is an average. And he goes from a metric of positive Ricci to positive constant uh, sectional curvature. How can you use the Ricci flow for that? Well, the Ricci flow is an evolution of the metric. The thing is, why flow? Why not minimization? People were trying to use analytical things to prove topological things. Three-dimensional topology for manifolds is awesome because you always have a Riemannian metric and it's the differentiable structure is a standard. So you can use this 
and people were trying to use it. Minimizations problem, uh, minimization processes, they could collapse too wildly. And you might lose everything really soon, really quick, when you try to minimize some functional. But if you try to flow your metric, things evolve in a more controlled manner. That's the intuition that they had back then, why flow could be useful instead of minimization. This is the main idea that allowed this theory to flourish. Okay, so let me explain how Hamilton got this theorem using the Ricci flow. Uh, actually, I'll just explain the steps in the proof. Uh, they are hard analysis, each one of them. So first one is that if you start with something with positive Ricci, then this property is preserved. It's like convexity for curve shortening flow. You are flowing in the, in the direction of Ricci. So if Ricci is positive, you are flowing all to the same direction and you remain positive Ricci curvature. Easy to understand, probably not so easy to prove. Uh, also, eventually, this flow will generate a singularity in finite time. If you start with positive curvature, it's the same as the curve shortening flow. If you start convex, eventually you will collapse. Same thing here. And also the matrix will collapse to a round point. The matrix will collapse altogether to zero. It's not gonna be like this product collapse. You will collapse altogether to zero. You're gonna actually shrink to a point. And this is going to be this round point in the sense that if you rescale, fixing the volume, so it's divided by the square root of the volume of uh, the cubic root of the volume of the whole manifold with that metric, this will converge to a metric of positive constant curvature. So this is the three steps in the proof of, of Hamilton, why you have a metric of constant positive sectional curvature whenever you have a metric of positive reach. A corollary, great thing, these spaces were classified. These spaces were classified. So corollary, pi one of M is finite. And if M is simply connected, it is S3. Does this remind you of something? If M is simply connected, it's diffeomorphic to S3? Uh, yeah, Hamilton was trying to prove the Poincaré conjecture. Oh, that's the relation. Actually, he was trying to prove the full geometrization. He had this insight that the flow, the rich flow, since it distributes curvature equally, like the heat flow, it could, in principle, hopefully, maybe, converge to a metric of constant curvature, like happened here. The main idea is not actually a metric of constant curvature, but a metric that is locally homogeneous. So it could happen. The main idea that you can hope for is that when t goes to infinity or when t goes to a finite number and you collapse, your metric converges to a locally homogeneous metric. Yeah, not exactly. Oh yeah, which implies that your starting manifold is geometric. If you have a locally homogeneous metric, that manifold is going to be geometric because the fundamental Riemannian covering will be isometric to n a geometry. Uh, but not exactly, we, we cannot hope for this because there are several manifolds that are not geometric. So we need to make some kind of decompositions. And maybe the Richard flow can help us with that too. So that's Hamilton's train of thought. The big issue was to control other singularities. The round point singularity was a good one. 
if everything collapses to something of positive curvature, you understand. So the round point, good singularity, I like that. The problem is that other singularities might appear. So the big problem was to control these other singularities. First, Hamilton proved, so, so Hamilton is working on the Ricci flow. Like he has several, several, several papers uh, about the Ricci flow. One of these, these results is that the metric develops a singularity at finite time, if and only if the curvatures blow up. So you cannot have other kind of singularities like, I don't know, a corner. You have to blow up your, your curvature. The curvature cannot be bounded and you develop a singularity. The curvature has to be unbounded. So after blowing up, using this scale of curvature, Hamilton could produce a list of all the singularities that could appear as the Ricci flow for a closed term manifold. And here's the theorem. There are some of them, I'm not going over. And he also conjectured that some of these singularities should not appear here. More importantly, we conjecture that this and that cannot form and some others here couldn't form. But Hamilton was only on the conjectural part. And this is a nice survey of Hamilton and, and look at the name of the survey, the formation of singularities in the Ricci flow. Understanding singularities of the Ricci flow was the main thing. Then we go to our last persona of this, uh, this historical account, which is Grisha Perelman, Gregory Perelman. And Perelman considered himself a student of Hamilton's. Like he said, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. I'm gonna study this. And Perelman is a genius. He followed the program proposed by Hamilton and he really understood Hamilton's conjecture. He really understood what are the regions of large curvature that may develop when you are creating the reach flow, when you are running the reach flow. And Perman did several breakthroughs. The first one is this, the curvature blows up only in regions diffeomorphic to the round point. So it's either like everything shrinks to something which has in the limit positive curvature. So you are a uh, quotient of the tree sphere in this region where the curvature blows up, or you have something called a cylinder, like the second example, you are collapsing S, S2 cross an interval now. It's not gonna be the whole S1, it's gonna be just an interval. So you will collapse in this region or you collapse in regions which are bounded by a sphere. You could collapse over a ball, a tree ball or the complement of a ball in RP3. So this is two spaces which are bounded by spheres. You have a boundary sphere for these spaces. So the idea now, since we understand what is the topology of these regions, let's cut them off. These are bad, bad regions. Unless the round point, the round point will like that. So the idea of Hamilton, proposed by Hamilton and followed by Perelman was to surgery these regions, take them away of your manifold, either removing them altogether or replacing these regions with standard caps. This, be, oh, I will go over in more details. Surgery in case A is just remove the component. And that's okay because we know that if singularity of type A happens, you are geometric. That part, it's, it's geometric. 
So we are proving geometrization. So, okay. Surgery in case B. Let's think of a collapsing region with the topology of S2 cross 0, 1. So we'll start with your Riemannian three manifold, closed uh, Riemannian three manifold. You let the Ricci flow go, you flow the Ricci flow, and what you will see is this collapse over a cylinder singularity. Here in this picture, the, the, these regions aren't flowing. It's just because I was lazy, but everything is flowing, right? Just, but the collapse is just over this long tube. So when you have a singularity of the type S2 times 0, 1, you look where you started. There is this region on the original manifold. Right before the flow collapses, the metric is still smooth. So the topology is still controlled. So before the collapse, you know that the metric will explode in this region. And this region has the topology of S1 cross 0, 1, of S2 cross 0, 1. So there is this region here in your manifold. Then you look at this region. Now you chop it off. Take your favorite scissor, take, take, take it off. Now you have boundary. You have boundary components. These blue lines, these blue circles are S2s, they are spheres. So we want to remove these boundaries by attaching balls. We want to attach balls. When you take a sphere, which is in the boundary, you glue a ball, then this sphere is no longer on the boundary. Now this sphere is on the interior. So that's what you want to do. You want to glue back balls. And this word here, standard, is going to be important next. But right now, don't worry about it. You glue back balls. When you glue back balls, you have two manifolds without boundary. You have two manifolds without boundary. Now they are closed manifolds again. And this process actually is a decomposition in a connected cell. If you have this neck and you cut it off, it's the same thing as decomposing over the central sphere. The central sphere is separating into this region and that region, and you have M1 and M2, and M was originally a connected cell. So, okay, this is one surgery type B. And now we have surgery of type C when you have a blow up region bounded by a sphere. Now it's the same thing as before, but instead of using two standard caps, you just replace by one. If you have a region, a bad region bounded by a sphere, you just remove that region and you attach a ball. So it's the same thing as before, but now instead of making a connected sum, it's remaining, uh, instead of decomposing as a connected sum, it's remaining a closed pre manifold. But it could happen two things. The first thing is if the region was a ball, then you are not doing anything actually on the topology. You are changing the metric. You are not changing the topology. You are changing the metric because of that word standard. Because now we don't want that region to remain collapsing. You want the region to run smoothly. So you want to change the metric in that region so it doesn't collapse. And that's hard. Uh, but if you had like an RP3 minus a ball, you are losing one RP3. You are changing RP3 by S3. But then you were again making a connected sum of M, you, you find out that M had this sphere where inside this sphere you had RP3 and outside this sphere you had something else, M1. And now this is exactly how a connected sum works. So you again, you don't decompose it as a connected sum because the RP3 con component is not there anymore but you know that M originally had an RP3 component 
and RP3 is geometric. So that's not too bad. That's okay. Okay, so that's the process of a surgery, but now we need to do the rich flow with surgeries. So what is the topological change? You either don't, don't change the topology, you just change the metric. If you have, <clears throat> sorry, if you have a ball or you lose a whole component, which is geometric and that's, fine, or you decompose them as a connected sum. These are the three possibilities. And here comes Perelman's second breakthrough. After the surgery, after the surgery, the properties of the Ricci flow remain the same. This is hard. This is really hard because you are changing things. The original manifold could be analytical and now you have something only C2. So Perelman had to make the standard caps really standard. He needed the metric on these standard caps to glue smoothly everywhere and to be like down to the detail something that would not collapse at least not uh, for 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 a finite time at least for a positive time you don't want to make a surgery and then you collapse at the same time that that doesn't help so the surgery needs to have a good property that the original one doesn't okay so the, the properties of the Ricci flow remain the same, especially regarding blow up points, because you could have different blow up points. You could have created different singularities once you do this whole thing, but you don't. This is Perelman's second breakthrough. And here is where the word standard plays a major, major role. Furthermore, this is also part of the breakthrough, but uh, this was, little less difficult. <laughs> For any compact interval in time, there is only a finite number of surgeries. You will never need a sequence of surgeries converging to a finite time. So if you want to flow until 10, maybe you will need 229 surgeries, but it's just 129. It's not infinitely many. It's not a sequence of surgeries. For any compact interval, you only have a finite number of surgeries that you need. And if that's the case, the Ricci flow is defined forever with surgeries. The Ricci flow with surgeries is defined forever. So this is Perelman's second breakthrough. And let me explain why the second breakthrough was like a breakthrough. Uh, there's something people call the Perelman shortcut because Perelman could have done this proof using his third breakthrough, but yeah, let's make a shortcut now. Just, just look at hypothesis. <laughs> you know where this is going, right? If M is closed and pi one of M is finite, then the Ricci flow becomes extant in finite time. Uh, that's what you were expecting. All right, but let's make a corollary. The elliptization and the Poincaré conjecture are three. Just because of this shortcut. If M is closed and pi one is finite, the Ricci flow becomes ex extant in finite time. What does he mean to become extant? It means that you just removed all the components. It means that you are empty. The rich flow gives you empty solution. The proof of the corollary using Perelman's shortcut. If pi one is finite, anytime you have a decomposition by a connected sum, you have one piece which is simply connected 
and the other piece which carries all the topology. Because if you have a non-trivial connected sum, two non-trivial pi ones, your original pi one will be a free group, will be infinite. So since the flow becomes extinct after an infinite time, so you only have a finite number of surgeries. And if you have a finite number of surgeries, you have at most a finite number of connected sums. And each of these connected sums, each of these factors collapses to a round point. If each of these factors collapses into a round point, one of them is gonna carry the topology, is gonna be a quotient of S3 with finite fundamental group, with whole fundamental group of M, and the others are just this Q. And this is the proof of Poincaré's conjecture. This is so cool. Yeah, Perelman's short point. He's not even, he never mentions the word Poincaré in his papers. It's so cool. Yeah. Like I did it, but I, I'm not even mentioning it. Yeah. Okay. So I said that Perelman could have used his third breakthrough to prove Poincaré's conjecture as well. And now what we'll present it to you. This is the complementary situation. If the rich flow with surgeries never becomes extinct. So you are always non-empty when you make surgeries. You could have now, you could do infinitely many surgeries now, but at a finite time, only finite many. But now you are doing surgeries all the way up to infinity. Maybe you are in a self-similar solution. You have solutions that don't change for the rich flow. But what happens if you have a flow with surgeries that never becomes extinct? For a sequence of times going to infinity, you can rescale the metric by some factor and one of the following happens. The first thing that could happen is that these rescalings converge to a complete hyperbolic metric in your manifold. So you don't have any connected sums. You basically don't have surgeries. Then you have a complete, or maybe you have a finite number of surgeries, this factors collapse and the remaining factor will have this property. So you have a complete hyperbolic metric on M1. So M1 is hyperbolic. Or it doesn't converge and up to a subsequence, it collapses. Now this collapse is harder. This collapse is much harder than the collapse by the Ricci flow. Because now you are not just running an equation, you are running an equation, you are rescaling. And this rescaling is hard. But if the metric collapses, if this rescaled metric collapses, they collapse only in regions diffeomorphic to these two guys. You are either T2 cross zero one, or you are a twisted bundle, twisted I bundle over the climb bar. We've heard of this. We've heard of these people, right? So in this case, in the other regions, whatever you don't collapse, you have torus boundary. Whatever you don't collapse, you now have torus boundary. And the interior, of these regions where the metric doesn't collapse, these rescaled metrics will converge to locally homogeneous metrics, complete locally homogeneous metrics. Corollary geometrization conjecture. That's exactly what geometrization was saying. You will cut over to right, and then you will have these pieces this pieces and the rest is geometric. Then of course you go the last step, 
you change the client bottle bundle to as we did, then you add a sole component if you if you need. But yeah, the geometrization conjecture is true. And here is a quote by, by Bill Thurston in 2005, like a couple of years after Perelman's third breakthrough. Perelman, with tremendous focus and virtuosity, constructed a beautiful proof where I and others fail. It, it is a proof that I could not have done. Some of Perelman's strengths are my weaknesses. This is Bill Thurston speaking. <laughs> and his method begin with a three-dimensional shape that is irregular, complicated, and hard to analyze or take in. The shape changes and evolves much like a bubble to even itself out, quickly smoothing small scale irregularities following the rich flow as developed by Richard Hamilton. Bubbles can pop. Sometimes a bubble breaks up and it splits apart, but Perriman found ways to analyze and control this process to show that eventually, all bubbles glide into a perfect form. This is beautiful. This quote is, is beautiful. Uh, and, and, and you can actually see that that's what happens after you read this. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. And one thing that people say, why topologists didn't prove the point I have on Junction? because there is no topology. The problem about the Poincaré conjecture is that the hypothesis is that there is no topology. And so it was hard. And that's where analysis and geometry and all these things came into place. So in 2006, in Madrid at the ICM, for his contributions to geometry and his revolutionary insights into the analytical and geometric structures of the Ricci flow, Perriman was awarded, uh, no, refused. He was gonna be awarded the Fuse Medal, but he refused the prize. But in 2010, at the Clay Mathematics Institute, he was awarded the Millennium Prize, the only and the one and only Millennium Prize so far awarded. The millennium problems were seven problems that the Clay Institute said, yeah, these are the most important problems in mathematics of this millennium so far. And one of them was the Poincaré conjecture. And in 2010, they recognized that Perriman had proved the Poincaré conjecture. So the Clay Mathematics Institute hereby awards the millennium prize for the resolution of the Poincaré conjecture to Grigory Perriman. And he also refused this award. And as far as I'm concerned, he refused because he wanted to share the prize with Hamilton. Because in Perriman's mind, his and Hamilton's contributions were equal. And I can see that. And but the detail is that this award included a $1 million prize. And yeah, he refused it. So good for him, I guess. They used the money to chair uh, to fund a chair position in Poincaré's Institute in Paris. And here's a quote by Perriman: "Everybody understood that if the proof was is correct, then no other recognition is needed." And he lived by it. He actually lived by it. Yeah, so here are some references for the rigid flow. If you like the intuition, maybe you want now to tackle the analysis and Perriman's papers. I mean, uh, they are there on the archive. They were never published. Uh, he just posted them and he's retired from research as far as the world is concerned by now. So yeah, I stop here. Thank you very much. So questions? Ah, oh, Alessandra asked, do you think it's possible to have a geometrization for non-orientable manifolds? Yes, it is possible. But uh, I think that it is already kind of really advanced or maybe even proved. But I honestly am not sure how it goes. 
the geometrization for non-orientable. The thing is, uh, non-orientable manifolds, they are always double covered by orientable manifolds. So you can always reduce your non-orientable thing to the orientable case by a double cover. So in some sense, it should be solved by now. Uh, what about four manifolds? Yeah, four manifolds, they, they have, it's much more difficult to try geometrization there because they have exotic structures. Remember that I said that three manifolds are awesome because being homeomorphic and being diffeomorphic is equivalent. Four manifolds, that's not true anymore. So to try to make a geometrization, conjecture is probably really hard. And there will be much, many, 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 many more geometric uh, ge model geometries. Probably, if I'm not mistaken, I am almost guessing right now, I think that you have infinitely many model geometries in dimension four, but I am almost guessing. I'm a three manifold guy, and I am I, I actually hardly know about three manifolds. Any other question? Okay, so uh, I thank you again. <laughs>